asked you how many women you could name who took part in Nazi Germany. Could you name any? One? Two? Maybe Anne Frank? Ava Braun if you think long and hard enough? How about men? The list goes on and on, and many biographies are to be found on the topic of the men who ran Nazi Germany. This is my feeble attempt to change that, and to share the stories, good and bad, of the women who were involved in a very controversial part of history. Wearing nothing but snakeskin boots, I blazed a footpath, the first radical road out of the old kingdom toward a new unknown. When I came to those great flaming gates of burning gold, I stood alone in terror at the threshold between paradise and earth. There I heard a mysterious echo, my own voice singing to me from across the forbidden side. I shook awake, at once alive in a blaze of green fire. Let it be known, I did not fall from grace. I leapt to freedom. The women living in Nazi Germany took leaps to freedom. Some leapt toward the freedom offered by the Nazi party, and some leapt toward the freedom that they believed could be found anywhere but the Nazi party. The women whose stories we are telling took their own unique leaps toward what their definition of freedom was. The stories told of this time in history often include men such as Hitler, Stalin, and Churchill. In an attempt to gain insight into a complete picture of the culture of Germany during the reign of the Nazi party, the stories we will tell are of women of all stations, opinions, and religions. These are the women forgotten in the documentaries. These are women living their lives in the new definition of normal that the Nazi party created. In order to understand the situation of these women, there needs to be a proper understanding of the history of their involvement in the German state. During the Weimar Republic, before the time of Hitler, there were very conservative views of women. This meant that if women wanted to serve their nation, they could use their womanly capacities. In order to do this, they formed organized women's auxiliary groups. During the Kaiserreich, their general population had very anti-feminist views and women were not allowed to join political parties. However, the loss of World War I changed this and the right wing lost their battle to keep women out of politics. Although it was a loss, there was also much gain as the majority of women had conservative views and joined the right wing parties. A very simple way to describe women's values at the time of the Weimar Republic would be that they supported German and Christian values and had nostalgia for the monarchy of the past. There was female support of the budding racist agenda, but it was moderated by Protestant women who questioned the Christianity in such actions. The major deciding factor for many was support for keeping the integrity of the Volk, or the German race, and due to this, Hitler's agenda was very appealing. The Nazi ideals swore to keep the integrity of the race at the expense of the women, and despite the detriment that this brought them, many women supported it, hopeful for positive change. Equal rights for women, Hitler declared, means that they receive the esteem they deserve in the sphere nature has assigned to them. This sphere included having children and keeping a husband happy. Many adjustments were made to the way women were treated in society when Hitler came to power. A marriage loan of 1,000 marks was offered for couples who qualified as certain to be fully of the correct German race, and they were paid back by one-fourth every time the couple had a child. Women were highly discouraged from cosmetics and any type of dress that could be seen as decadent. Sex appeal was labeled Jewish cosmopolitanism, and there was an effort made to create a Germanic style that would encourage women to dress as the government wanted them to. Physical fitness became a top priority, and women were charged with the responsibility of keeping in shape to better prepare themselves for pregnancy. Ideas of love were replaced with ideas of racial awareness, as anyone who wanted to get the marriage loan offered had to go through extreme medical testing. SS wives had to go to bridal school to prepare them for marriage. 27,958 women who were deemed unfit for motherhood to the pure race were sterilized against their will by the close of 1934 and 5% died due to the sterilization procedures. Unmarried Aryan women were encouraged to donate a baby to the Fuhrer by having an illegitimate child with an SS officer. There were no rights to their own bodies. Abortion was considered illegal and birth control was not offered. Jewish women who had married non-Jewish men were often forced to divorce them and the abortion laws didn't apply to them. The Women's Labor Service was begun, where unmarried women went to help the war efforts by waking up at 5.30 and working with farmers, milking cows, and making cheese, all the while being taught to exercise and prepare for motherhood. The point of woman to Hitler was to marry and preserve the pure race through full-blooded children. There was no other point to having them in his society. 
In fact, once when he was asked what he had done for the women of Germany, he said, In my new army, I have provided you with the finest fathers of children in the whole world. Even in literature written by respected theologians, there is evidence of a pattern that German women have been made to follow. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said little about women, and when he did speak, he mentioned the obvious temptations and the will of God for his servants to be pure, furthering the ideals of marriage being a woman's only important earthly duty. Brings up a highly debated controversy. Were the women of Nazi Germany victims or were they perpetrators? On the victim side of this argument are those who call themselves cultural feminists. They argue that the patriarchal regime of Nazi Germany victimized the women by forcing them to bear children for the pure race. All of their actions were influenced by their government and their husbands. They had no choice but to do what they did and reproduce for their country. The perpetrator side is involved in gender theory. This, they cite the evidence that conservative women or the majority of women in Germany were actually empowered by the patriarchal Nazi government. Since, with the rise of Hitler, they supposedly had more power in society than they ever had before, they actually had the opportunity to help their country directly by bearing pure-blooded children. One arguer says that, by surrendering their political rights in return for the honor and prestige bestowed on them as mothers in the fatherland, German women ultimately played an equal role in helping make war and genocide possible. The following stories all illustrate leaps to freedom and I would encourage you to watch, listen, and absorb these stories and decide for yourself if these women were victims or perpetrators. It is not my goal to convince you to one side or another, but rather to encourage reflection on this time period and the women who lived then. It is often very easy to label the past as history and then to pretend as if it never happened. I hope that through introspection and knowledge of what occurred, we can avoid any repetition of the horrendous events of Nazi Germany. There was not one home where you didn't have any losses. Of. Liesl Riedel was a young Catholic woman who fell in love with Protestant Nazi sympathizer and SS member Gustav Wilhaus. She went to trade school after deciding that farm life was not for her. After school, she got a job at her local Nazi newspaper. She and Gustav were married on October 30, 1935, before the SS had approved of their marriage. After a few years of trying, they had a daughter, Heike, in May of 1939. They were banned from raising her a Catholic due to Nazi fears that Catholicism undermined the Nazi set of ideals. In March of 1942, they moved to Ukraine, where Gustav was appointed commandant of the camp at Janowska. Later, Holocaust survivors called him a natural-born killer. Liesel herself would stand on the second-floor balcony of their house near the walls of the camp and shoot Jews who were working below. Her five-year-old daughter would clap for joy at the sight. The mother-daughter pair would also go into their gardens and shoot Jews at short range. After the war, she was one of only 16 people and four women who were indicted for the mass murder of 400,000 Jews in the Viv area. She and Fräulein Hanna were among the women. Although she was indicted, investigators were unable to prosecute her because she did not hold an official position in the Nazi party. And this was where they had their own hair and sheep um, and small animals during the summer that we'd be raising here. Wow. And, and here the, in the grass, we'd take our little ducklings and our little chickens. Oh. And, and we, would, we would watch them so no hawk or crow could attack them. So we had to keep watch on them. Yeah. yeah. So this mm. is where you grew up. This is Check out this barn huge here. Barn. What, do you know when I was when I was small, this burned down once. Mm -hmm. They had an arson. So the rocks are like. Wait, it was an arson. Yeah, yeah. Someone burned it down. Someone burned it. Oh yeah, gosh. a young man who was, uh, I think, he, he belonged somewhere, somewhere in the village here, but I guess was never treated for a mental um, instability. Burned it down. And he burned it down. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Crazy. It, this this Whoa, was that needs to this be was out. Yeah, this this rainwater. They love the rainwater. The watering 
healthy. Mm-hmm. So here, so this is the house, and this was the at the very end. Uh-huh. It was higher, and, and at the very end was the horse stable, uh-huh. and then came the cow stable, and then this was the barn, uh-huh. and the barn is fascinating. I don't know how much. Take a look. Oh, Ma. Oh, it's huge. Let me get my flashlight out so you can see. This is all changed now, and there was a big halo loft. And we would bring the, the big wagons in with the hay from the back, and then they would unload the hay. In a little minute, there would be the bell ringing in the morning, and then they would make an announcement, and they would call upon the family and give them information where this person died and, and, and of what. And later on, you would find out that these were very often lies. It was just done um, to sound good. Pauline Niesler studied nursing on the Rhine River and joined the Nazi party in 1937. She was called by police in December of 1939 to join nurses at Grafenek Castle, which was 40 miles from Stuttgart. The castle was a home for the disabled and mentally ill. A doctor would go around and examine the patients, deciding who would be gassed and who wouldn't be. The majority of the time, the patients were killed within 24 hours of arriving, then cremated, their ashes mixed, then sent home to their families in individual urns with fake causes of death. Pauline helped with the gassing and administered lethal injections every day for five years. She often witnessed the gassing, but justified her work saying that death by gas didn't hurt. Again, she justified this by saying they had died painlessly, quoting, I never understood mercy killings as murder. My life was one of dedication and self-sacrifice. One of the most famous stories of Jews in the Holocaust can be found in Night by Eli Wiesel. The story of his mom and younger sister is perhaps most haunting. After enduring a long, horrible train ride, the family arrived at Birkenau. Immediately, Eli's mom and youngest sister were separated from their family and sent to the gas chambers. This was the fate of many Jewish women and children on their entrance to concentration camps. And these are now garages. Okay. And years ago, it was a woodshed like this. The whole area was woodshed. And then it was a, had a flat roof. Mm-hmm. And in the spring, when the sun was warm enough, we would climb up on the, on the roof and take our sun <laughs> on this flat roof. It was, a, it was really fun. Then the, the other thing that I remember very clearly was that the military would prepare for war and they would practice. They had huge armies. Um, Mostly, I would say, um, cavalry and infantry, and they would be uh, staged without our surroundings of the village, and they would practice, and they would use heavy military weapons to do the practice, and you would hear those were the first signs of what war would sound like. So you would you were introduced to the sound of war. They were trained and that was sad. But it was also exciting because there there was the military and every soldier looked handsome and, and was fascinating and um, we would adore the military. We would really adore them because these were the people who had the courage to fight in the war. Johanna, or Hannah, as she was often called, was a member of her local Hitler youth group and lived in Western Germany. She went to a middle school for girls where she joined the aforementioned group before membership was required. Her peers called her a tomboy, however, she was also said to have had childbearing hips. 
She started off as a stenographer in her town and joined the Nazi party officially. She was relocated by the party at the age 22 to Ukraine. In her new town of Volodymyr Volinsky, there were already anti-G measures in place, including target shooting sprees and having a sealed off guarded ghetto. Hannah often accompanied her boss on trips to the Jewish ghetto. On September 16, 1942, Altvater entered the ghetto and approached two Jewish children, a six-year-old and a toddler who lived near the ghetto wall. She beckoned to them, gesturing as if she were going to give them a treat. The toddler came over to her. She lifted the child into her arms and held it so tightly that the child screamed and wriggled. Altvater grabbed the child by the legs, held it upside down, and slammed its head against the ghetto wall as if she were banging the dust out of a small carpet. She threw the lifeless child at the feet of its father. There were no German officials present while she killed this child. She would often go to the children's ward of a makeshift hospital nearby and randomly pick children to throw off the balcony onto the pavement below. Other witnesses say she particularly liked to lure Jewish children with candy and then shoot them in the mouth with her small pistol. At the end of 1943, she was moved to Lutsk due to obedience issues. Her denazification papers after the war said she was eligible for work and she ironically ended up as a welfare caseworker for youth. She later married and gained the last name Zell, which means prison cell, and adopted a six-year-old boy after she started sponsoring his education. She was charged with murder and during her trial from September 1978 to October 31, 1979, she insisted she was innocent. She pleaded that during the war she had been young and had never taken part in murders and was eventually acquitted because of the time that had passed since her crimes, as well as the judge's ruling of insignificant evidence. The trial ended in 1979 and a public protest ensued. Due to this protest, a second trial began in 1982 with 20 new witnesses. However, there were contradictory statements and stories and eventually the prosecutor asked the court for an acquittal. Johanna Zell was not charged for any of her crimes, and she spent no time in jail. Ruth Mendel was part of one of the last groups of Jews to be deported to Auschwitz. A Czechoslovakian citizen, she remembers living in the ghetto and having young German girls refuse to play with her because she was a Jew. At the age of four, a boy in the Hitlerjungen knocked her down and ran over her with his bike but her family was unable to press charges. She and her family were deported on April 19, 1943, and what they were told was a birthday celebration for Hitler. When they first arrived in Auschwitz, no gassing selections were made from their group, as the commanders assumed they would die soon anyway. The first thing the Germans did was shave their heads and tattoo on their numbers. Then they were stripped and able-bodied workers were sent to dig ditches. Ruth's mother took care of her in the camp, even during an episode of typhus. After they were released, Ruth says that it was as if her mother had already died, as she had lost her husband, son, business, and faith. After the end of the war, Ruth returned to Frankfurt, at first mourning the dead underneath the buildings built on top of bomb sites. However, she reached the conclusion that they had brought this on themselves by their own hatred. The sad um, story came in 1945 when I was uh, 13 years old. On, on fifth, uh, on, going on 14, our practice is confirmation, and you had to um, you had to be relocated because of the instructor who was a pastor in a neighboring village. And um, I would be relocating with my school as well. And the teacher was a Nazi. He was a fanatic Nazi. And when he knew there was any student who came from a Christian background, they would be really very critically looked at. And they would be really challenged. And uh, there was a... I had warnings through my sisters who had done, gone through the um, experiences prior to mine because I was the younger one, the younger sister, and it was just very scary to see a fanatic teacher who put everything just in the focus of, of Hitler being the god. 
Hitler being the one you can admire. And the Christian faith was laughed about. And when I was confirmed on the day of, of confirmation, uh, we had a church service and everybody had gathered in the church. And um, when we were just about to receive our first communion, which was a real festive day, where you receive communion as a compliment. And in the midst of communion, when the introduction was just made of the, the statement of what the bread and wine is, and the blessings of, of the sacrament, a, this teacher burst into our church, interrupted the service, and said, everybody out, everybody out. There is a warning that there are Air Force uh, units flying to Berlin to bomb out the city, and uh, there's no gathering of people allowed. Um, our pastor, who was a very mature person who had lost his own son in the Italian front, uh, he was about in his 70s, and he calmly continued with the worship service. When when he came to Holy Communion, he just continued, did not interrupt, and not one person in the whole congregation, which was probably 120 people, it was a village church, it was, it was a real committed um, gathering. None of the people left, and the worship closed, and we were able to go to our, to go back to our homes and celebrate. And when I came home, which was also my birthday on the 19th of March, this was in 1945, just before the war ended. When I came home from the from the confirmation ceremony and wanted to celebrate at home, my uncle, who was a postmaster, and who was the only one in the whole village who had a phone because he was from the, the, the postmaster, he entered the phone and was the message that his daughter, who was drafted, forced into the defense um, um, at the Rhine River, she was killed. So on the same day of my birthday, we had not, we had the first, the, the interruption of the, of my confirmation, but everybody stayed firm and celebrated. And then we come home, and there is the the news that my cousin was was killed, and she was um, let's see, I think she was 19, and she was called in to the to the service, and um, so you can imagine what that meant. Ellie was a 13-year-old Jewess in Hungary. She remembers the first time she was forced to wear the yellow stars and the crowded Jewish ghettos in her memoir, I Have Lived 1,000 Years. She and her mother are separated from their family and sent to Auschwitz, where they are not gassed simply on the premise that Ellie has blonde hair. They end up in Plotzau, a labor camp where they were forced to work 12 hours a day. After Ellie's mom is injured and nearly paralyzed, the pair ends up back in Auschwitz. Ellie sneaks her mother out of infirmary there, where she would have surely been gassed. Later they escape to Augsburg, and the Americans liberate them while they were on the train headed back to the camp. Ellie, her mother, and her grandfather are the only ones left in their family. Searching for a new home, they immigrate to America in hopes of a fresh start. See, from there, from the window, from that window, mm -hmm. it was also an entrance to the top 
like the attic of the chicken coop. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it was straw. Mm-hmm. And we would climb out from that window mm-hmm. into this coop. And we would hear the Russians coming and going, celebrating in the house or doing all kinds of things. And Martin and Joachim, the youngest brothers, they would always give us signs when we knew that there's nobody inside. They would say, you can come down, come down, come down. And as soon, they were like spies. They were oh, they were perfect spies. No. As soon Hello. as they know somebody, a little uneasiness, they would come, stay there, stay there. They would give us signs. Oh, and my mother was the only one in the house. Every, all the, the, the boys were there, the Achim and Martin and Barry, and they would they would just watch over the sisters. Six sisters would hide there for oh, whenever possible. Whenever there was danger, we would be up there, sleep there, not eat there, but in between the pauses when nobody was around, we would come out. And then go back. Yeah. And then. And um, it was, it was all the negative, the damage that, or the suffering that people would go through, but never, any word about the concentration camps. And my eyes were open to the concentration camps when we saw the first hundreds and hundreds of people walking barefoot in striped pajamas, types of prison wardrobe, accompanied by military, German military. This was two days, or maybe weeks before the end of the war, when they would open up the prisons. And those who, who were still alive, they were the, the concentration victims and they were marched up to the west of the River Elbe, which was became the borderline of the Americans and the Russians. They had made a contract. The Elbe would be the breaking point for the Russian section and the, the, the Western section. And that became West Germany and it became East Germany. So we were just about 80 miles from the border of west and east. I was hoping that we would be on, the, we would be in the west, but the decisions were made and we became victims of the east. So the, 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 the shock and the eye open to me as a 14 year old was, here are the victims of the concentration camps, which I had no idea. And I remember my father and my mom, one visit that we made to my uncle's home was a very suspicious um, conversation that my parents had as we came home in our coach, uh, where they were just depressed and it was not like my parents at all. And they had heard that one of their nephews was in the SS and he had served under the force of the Russians and he knew of the concentration camps. And this was probably half a year or so before the war came to an end and before we were informed about the horror of the concentration camps. We had no idea. My parents, I think, then heard about and learned about this and they, from there on, you could just tell, they were shocked. And when the masses of streams of three, four in a row prison, imprisoned um, victims of the concentration camps marched to our town, they were just, there was the eye opener. And they would be housed in the fields of our own backyards and others and my father would open up provisions so that they could all at least have a have a potato we could not never make enough soups or make enough food for 
all the refugees. I think my older sisters, they did nothing but provide some kind of needed soup for anybody who was hungry. And my parents would just make bread, bake bread and bake bread and bread bread. And one loaf of bread was like a piece of gold for people who were hungry. They, they died for Volk und Vaterland. That's what they would say. We would, as children, we would sing from uh, as a class, you know, little kids in the, the village. Uh, children, they were meant to be here and would gather up and we would sing. And there was a Nazi and there were the Deutschland, Deutschland, über alles and all the, uh, the hymns, the songs that were patriotic and with this. And lots of people did it because you're asked, you're forced. Let's say there is, there is a law, there's an, a rule that on a Sunday, nobody will eat a full meal. You make a soup. You make just a simple, basic soup. And so they call it Eintops Essen. You put everything in one pot and that is the meal for the day. And that should be served on Sundays because the custom was that on Sunday you would have a more wholesome meal with a chicken and you know, have pork and you would have a wholesome meal. But that was impossible. That, that was not allowed. And um, I remember we were sitting around the table on a Sunday and we had chicken and as usual our soup and our, our vegetables and chicken and uh, two of the Nazi leaders who came into our house and checked what we're eating and my father simply when they when they come uh, sort of arrogantly remarked that this is wrong he just told them you go your own way and, and we we can eat and handle our own Sunday meal so you could speak up, but you could not, I think, openly do it, but indirectly you did. But these were really, um, I think, party leaders who were so fanatic. They knew my family, and they did knew they our come? Christian attitude, and they, they came anywhere. And, and you just had to tell them, this is how far we go, no matter what. And they got the message, but... I mean, it never went any farther than that. So we were never in political danger, no. Mm -hmm. Politically speaking, I think they were not able to control the individual family. But they would, she would sense the, uh, I think, the attitude was definitely not appreciated. When my father, who was 56 when the Russians uh, captured our, our village, he was, um, since he had a weapon in the house, which um, was not allowed, it was, a, it was the worst uh, offense you could, could have done. And I guess he wasn't aware of the fact that this was an old hunting weapon that was on top of one of those cabinets where you, you never think of. And he was able, the Russians were able to find this weapon. When they found this weapon, they had my father questioned. And though nobody understood German, nor did we understand Russians, we had one of our workers who was from Serbia. He was a World War II, prisoner of war, yeah. And he understood, understood some Russian. And so they dealt with my father and um, the Russians did not believe him that this is a weapon that is old and doesn't have any bullets in there, is, is innocent. Um, they decided that they would 
punish my father if we didn't know what it would be. So they took my father and my father would walk 10 feet ahead of the soldier who had my father's weapon, the old hunting gun, in his hands and they walked and they left the village and we thought, okay, this is it. My father will be imprisoned. But uh, maybe 10 minutes or so, we heard one of my sisters had walked quietly to see from a distance where my father would be walked to. And she actually experienced it. They threw my father and my father lived for two days, had an inner uh, lung bleeding, which was the dead, the death for him. And um, we were surrounding him. Where the while he died, there were the, the house full of Russians and military celebrating, drinking, and celebrating. And we were there and. Uh, Accompanied my dad for for his last for the last hour, and my father was such a committed Christian. He his last words were, um, "Father, give them, for they know not what they're doing." That's the, the translation from the German to the English. And Father, forgive, and then they will not what they do. I tell you, May 5, when my father died, everything was in bloom. The lilacs in our front yard, in our backyard, everything was in bloom and just growing. And the seeds that he planted, that broke my heart the most. I was, I was the one who would follow my father on our own property, big acreages, where you would put the seed of the rain that you would grow. And, and that summer, I tell you, it was the hardest thing for me to see the rain, you know, the corn grow. And it was the last time that my father did the same thing. And that was the lesson for the rest of my life. Because I'm, when it comes to forgiveness, this is the most yeah. promised and the most, I think, the most precious faith you can express in somebody. The women of this time all had their own unique struggles and circumstances, but they all chose the side they believed would lead to freedom. Today, the way the world, at least the Western world, views women has changed dramatically. The idea that women should be used only to grow a race is absolutely absurd to today's feminists. However, the history remains, and the women of Nazi Germany lived and died through it. Their stories should be a lesson for all women living in the world today. No, it is not a perfect world for women, and there is still a lot of work to be done. But we should all take away the courage to choose our own leaps to freedom, whatever direction that might be. I leapt to freedom. 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 I leapt to freedom.